You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for hitting that play button. This is another episode of the Dave Bulls Podcast. Uh, before we get to today's episode, I just want to say, again, thanks for everyone for always sharing this epi- these episodes. Not just this episode, but all the episodes. Uh, keep sharing the podcast. Uh, we actually just crossed 70K on this platform alone. Uh, on the other platform, we had well into the six digits, uh, but I actually, when I sw- swapped out, I actually lost all those downloads. So uh, when I hit 100,000 on here, it's going to be a pretty nice landmark for, for all of us. Uh, so again, thank you so much. I couldn't do it alone. Um, and also about the project I always keep talking about, I actually got a new storyboard artist. Uh, I just met with their director of cinematography, so now things are finally moving along. Uh, I had to push things from shooting this month to September. Um, we hit way too many delays. Um, the, 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 the previous storyboard artist kept delaying things, uh, so finally things are moving. Uh, so I'm going to shoot for the last weekend of, of uh, August or the first week of September, uh, probably September because it will be a lot cooler and also I'll have a lot more time to actually make sure this is right. So if you're interested at all at helping in any way, shape, or form, there's a ton of detail in the show notes. Um, everything from if you want to help out with crew uh, to whether if you want to help out promoting the thing, whether if you want to you know, use my one of my uh, affiliate links so I can use a couple of bucks uh, to, to, for, the, for this project. Uh, it'd be, it, it's going to be pretty cool. Um, so if you, if you want to help in any way, shape, or form, uh, there's ways, everything from, again, from helping me out um, to just retweeting it, which costs nothing, to using some of my affiliate links. And again, everything can be found uh, in the show notes. Uh, so without further ado, on this episode of the podcast, we have a returning guest who gained fame from making a $75 sh- uh, zombie film. Uh, it was actually a feature-length film. Uh, it cost $75 uh, or 45 pounds, and it was an absolute um, independent film smash hit uh, because it went to all the different festivals. Uh, we, we're we not going to talk too much about that but because we, we've already talked about that the first time he was here, but we, we kind of touch on it again. Uh, but now he's back with not one but two movies, uh, Night Shooters and A Fistful of Lead, which is actually going to be distributed by Sony. Uh, we're going to talk about that as well. So here we are. This is episode 220 with guest Mark V. Price. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. And uh, I haven't been to a cinema in ages. I can't go because I'm, I'm stuck finishing up this film. So I haven't had a chance to to really get into, you know, an air-conditioned cinema and just hide from the sun. But, um, well, see, that's a good problem to have, though. You, 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 it, can't, you can't watch movies because you're making movies. It is true, yeah. I think a lot of my friends are like, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And I'm like, oh, mate, I'd, I'd love to, but I got time. You know, I found the time to go and see Solo, which is unfortunate. But, <laughs> hey. <laughs> I, I did it. It's a thing. But um, yeah, it was a really empty cinema as well. It was like literally me. It was just me. I wandered in. This is a bank holiday in Streatham in London. So there's there's loads of kids around here who would just go to see anything just to talk. So I was like, oh, man, I'm screwed. This is going to be a horrible experience. And although it was, it wasn't because of the audience. There was no one there. And I thought, wow, this film got the audience it deserved. <laughs> it was absolutely <laughs> atrocious. But um but I feel bad hating it because, you know, I kind of want to be a little bit more supportive of, of, of films that I love. And I kind of think that I'm lucky to have Star Wars movies. Um, and I remember thinking when I was a kid and there wasn't even that much of a gap between them, how, like, starved I felt of Star Wars content. I never went to the expanded universe for any uh, for anything. It never really interested me. It was the films I was interested in. And, um, yeah, and all I had was two Ewok movies, which at the time I loved. <laughs> like... But yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I completely understand, man. After the Last Jedi, I I am done with those Star Wars movies. Um, I don't care anymore. I <laughs> I I begrudgingly. Okay, so I mean, j- just to give you a quick of the of the past three Star Wars films, okay? Yeah. The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and whatever the hell the the other one was called. Um, yeah. I I don't even remember. <laughs> that's how much I care. Um, it, it, <laughs> they all felt like the same movie. I had no clue what the hell was going on, um, and I'm just like, okay, well, it's over now, and I, I don't even know what 
this was supposed to do? I mean, is this supposed to set something up? No, because uh, it doesn't, didn't feel like that. Was this supposed to be a self-contained movie? No, nope, didn't feel like that either. Um, <laughs> what the hell is going on? See, the my whole thing was, I mean, I, 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 I the, the whole thing was Sook, Snook, Snooky. Oh, so yeah, Snook, I, yeah. That was, I, I gotta say, I feel I absolutely loved the Last Jedi. <laughs> that was the one I loved. The rest of them, I was like, oh, they're all right. And like, so that that was the one I loved. But yeah, Snook. With this oh, crazy Se- Sesame Street name, Mr. <laughs> Snokalophagus. And I was like, what the fuck's he called? <laughs> Do they normally have names like Mr. Bastard or some, some, something that's definitely evil? But uh, <laughs> Snoke, I was like, oh, he's going to teach you how to say the letter F. <laughs> well, so, I, 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 I was going to say, he, he actually was a cool character because, okay, he can control, he can read people's minds. Okay, now you got a really, really tough villain here. And he was defeated so easily, and I go, well, that that's there, there, there goes that was so anticlimactic. Oh, I, I honestly, I, it was the complete opposite. I think this is the, the the disparity between Star Wars movies. I think at the moment, particularly with this one, because it seems to really be pulling people in different directions. I was like, I was watching it, going, okay, Emperor shit, we're gonna see him in the next one, and then I suppose he'll probably get killed before Kylo Ren is like, I'm sorry, I killed my dad, uh, you know, um, or some shit like that. And instead, I got this scene that wiped him out in a way that I thoroughly was like, fuck yeah, this is awesome. And now I have a character. I have no idea where Kylo Ren is going in the next film. So I'm really interested now. I'm really, I'm really, I'm, I'm like, I'm in. I want to know what they're doing with him because he's not evil enough to want to be killed. He's not a good guy by any stretch of the imagination. He's a really interesting, conflicted character. And I don't know what the story's going to do with him. So I'm kind of curious. I'm in a position where I don't really know what's going to happen with this character. And he is the most compelling character in, in the movies. And so I, I'm kind of in. I'm, I'm, I'm on board. Uh, and I'm curious to see what J.J. Abrams can do when he ends something for a change. Because he normally starts stuff, which is why all of his stuff has these mysteries that he doesn't give a fuck about and there's no plan to end them. Now he has to. And I'm kind of curious to see what he's going to do with it, to be honest. But I don't, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't love it enough to, I mean, I love it a lot, but I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with the debates. I love listening to them. I love looking on YouTube and, and, and seeing all the, the angry, <laughs> angry hate. I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. And uh, I love how Chris McQuarrie, although he's got nothing to do with it, and Ryan Johnson are sort of like dealing with it on Twitter. I'm like, this is fascinating. It's just amazing to watch. It's like, I love trashy TV, and it's like trashy TV. It's these these bickering arguments. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. It's just a movie. It's okay if you didn't like it. I thought Rogue One was fine, and I kind of know the guy who made it. It's like, it's, you know, it's it's Rogue it's One, that fine. was it. Yeah, it is it is boring as fuck but it was it was you know the the end battle was great i know one of the x-wing pilots you know the one who could act um you know so it was it was fine it was a it was a decent it was it was an experience they're all an experience i just think that with solo i was by myself and so bored i was so bored i was just sitting there going i could text my girlfriend right now and i'm not going to be irritating anyone in the cinema but the downside is if she replies and i get into a conversation with her and this film suddenly gets interesting for about 20 minutes I, I'm I'm fucked. So I'm, I, I was a very good boy. I, I behaved myself. I, I I watched the film, and I was I was just so bored. Oh god, that robot, that fucking robot was the worst thing. I, I, worse than Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> Much worse than Jar Jar. Did, did you see it? Sorry, I shouldn't. I no, should no, check no. It. I, I haven't seen it yet uh, because I, after, right, the, I, I, after the Last Jedi, I, I'm officially just. I, I'm I'm I don't want to say I'm protesting the new Star Wars movies. I'm just I'm going out of my way not to watch them. Let's just say that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm not saying, like, you know, just download it without any money going back, although I think they've learned a lesson of some sort. I don't really know what that lesson is. Uh, maybe don't make movies about characters that no one gives a shit about. It's like, it's, Han Solo is such a non-character in Star Wars. I like, I think Harrison Ford's cool as fuck, and I love Han Solo in those movies. But, you know, as an adult watching Return of the Jedi, he contributes literally nothing to that story. Like, he, he doesn't do anything. He just sort of stands there and pulls derpy faces and doesn't do anything. And I'm just like, I'm really kind of, as an adult, I'm watching it going, it's amazing how everything sort of switched around. For me as a kid, watching Return of the Jedi, the stuff with the Emperor and Darth Vader was always the boring bits. Um, as an adult, the stuff with Darth Vader and the Emperor and Luke is the, are the best bits, and there aren't enough of those moments in that film for me. So it's it's it's, it's nice to see a film that's grown. But yeah, Harrison Ford's a character. There's nothing there. He doesn't even have a theme. The fucking Millennium Falcon has a theme. Han Solo doesn't have a theme in a movie. There's the, the score that's peppered with leitmotifs. There's not even a theme for Han Solo. It's fucking... So they made a movie out of it. It's like, shit, they didn't even come up with one for that. It's just... It was, it, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was not a film I liked much. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. But uh, also, yeah, definitely watch it to have a good old... Because uh, there's plenty in there to hate. 
and it definitely makes for a more fun conversation. <laughs> but yeah, there's a robot in it that's worse than Jar Jar Binks. Like I actually quite, I'd never hated Jar Jar Binks. So, you know, I thought, I thought as shit as he was, at least he had a really cool, like at the end, at the end battle in Phantom Menace, I kind of thought, yeah, he works. He's making me laugh. He's tripping over droids and accidentally killing things. That's fine. I'm, I'm all right with this. Um, but yeah, I think the the rest that yeah, oof, this 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 droid this this droid clearly played by another posh British actress who's never heard the fucking word droid before. You know what I mean? It's like it's it's weird. I don't know why they keep picking actors who don't give a shit about the thing they're in when there's a legacy of actors who chose to be actors because of Star Wars who you could find who would love to do it would bring a lot to that character. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, what, the word "droid." I know it's it's a uh, it's an interesting word. So well, it turns out that Luke Skywalker is something of a slave owner now because that's how they paint the picture of droids in Solo. And I was like, oh shit, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they I don't, do they do they want to go down this road. It's you know, <laughs> it's like um, oh yeah. I mean yeah, like those those R two D two and all those guys get a little bit shit on. But, uh, you know, it's because, I don't know, like, I've had to think about it now. I've had to think, fuck, what, what is this? Like, it's, it's maybe it's that Luke and, and no one understood that these things feel, even though they yell and scream and they panic and they express fear. And, you know, so you might hear the lightsaber then. I have a lightsaber fucking bottle opener. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, like, we, I, I clearly have a love for Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know. We, we, the, the last, the, the original three... Uh, four, five, and six are just you know I, I think they're universally loved. Um, I yeah. actually one, two, and three. I mean they're not they're not perfect, um, but they they you know at least there was some love. I, I think George Lucas actually yeah. loved put some love into them. He did like making them, and you could tell even though they were they were you know some moments were like what the hell is going on here, and you could tell there were some moments that made no sense. Like for instance in the in the Phantom Menace. When young Anakin jumps into that uh, into that fighter pilot, uh, sorry, and then into that yeah, fighter yeah, fighter yeah. plane, and there's a perfect size helmet just for him. And I'm like, wait, yeah, wait, yeah. wait a minute, why would there be a children size uh, helmet in a, uh, in a in a plane meant for grown men or or clones or what have you? Um, so or, or or robots, whatever the hell they were using. So then, um, and, and, things. What I've always loved about things like that is that. Like, those aren't accidents. Like, someone would have had to have designed that. And I think George Lucas is like, yeah, no, they'll never get it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> like, I always love those things, those those moments. And I always sort of do <laughs> – I throw a lot of those moments to myself and say, right, let's see if we can get away with this. And if you, if, uh, But I think it's kind of gone a weird way where if people spot things, they resent them. They're like, you're trying to trick me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 it's meant to be all part of the fun and games. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> But I, I like the prequels. I don't hate them. I, I like. I, I can see what the problems are, obviously. But I kind of, you know, I think like didn't James Cameron say something really interesting where he felt that those films took big steps. They took risks, and they 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 were huge steps. And and you know, it, it, collectively, in many ways, they failed. But in other ways, they were. You know, you've got to. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'd rather have films that take risks like that instead of the, the Force Awakens, which I, I I thoroughly enjoy the first two thirds of. But then it just becomes a bit of a nostalgia thing with, with, with Han Solo and Princess Leia. I'm like, look, none of these people want to be here. Like I, I, like, I had a happily ever after with these characters that I knew was going to be destroyed by making a sequel. You know, at least George Lucas was smart enough to go, you know what, you go back. There's a happily ever after there. We're not going to come back to this. So we'll go to a prequel and we'll, we'll go to where this all started and see if we can tell a darker story. And, and I was like, okay, you can't, you can't fault that, like, that understanding of the story that's told up to a point. Um, and yeah, and I think that like so, the second Han Solo comes back. I'm like, well, my happily ever an- uh, happily ever after ending is gone. So everyone's hatred of what Luke had become. I'm like, well, what the fuck do you expect? Like, they, the, Han Solo wasn't Han Solo in the Force Awakens by any stretch of imagination. He was more Indiana Jones in the last one that nobody liked than he was Han Solo in Force Awakens, which everyone seemed to love. And so I'm kind of like, eh, well, I think you know, this is not necessarily the, the characters aren't going to be the characters they're going to be sort of like the actors playing different versions of the characters it's you know it, it happens i guess it's uh, I, I've, I've accepted it and i'm in a good place now so however this next film is i'll be excited for it it'll come out i'll be underwhelmed or i'll love it i don't know we'll see but um you know i'd, I'd like to see more <laughs> you know so um yeah I, I just wonder what direction they, i just want them to be special you know i don't want one a year that doesn't seem to be working very well yeah it's um 
I think for the next one, whatever that is, I, I heard that they're just going to go right to VOD with it. Uh, no theater, um, <laughs> which which honestly is probably a good idea for them right now with all these movies. Did I mention last time that my idea for one? I got a spin off one, right? Uh, so get a look at this. This is, is going to be fucking classic. Um, Max Rebo Band, right? Starts in Jabba's Palace, they survive that explosion. They're like, fuck this, Max, fuck you, I'm out of here. They'll say, you know, glebe off or whatever, you know, alien language. So they, they're essentially saying, fuck you, you blue elephant cunt. But they'll say it in a, in a, in a, you know, in, in, in their own alien language so we can have it in a kid's film. And then, <laughs> and then they'll split up, right? And then Max will be asked by the Emperor, like, I've got this plan, I'm going to destroy the fucking rebels on Endor, it's going to be amazing, I want a big party afterwards, so the Max Rebo band is asked to reform, so it's like the Blues Brothers, where he's going around trying to get the band to reform, they reform, they go on the Death Star, shit starts going down, it's about them trying to get off the Death Star during the Battle of Endor, and uh, they, they end up thinking they've booked a really cool gig, um, and they're the cunts that end up playing Yub Nub. <laughs> there we go. That's that's it. That's going to be the story. Low low stakes, high octane. Uh, Max Rebo Band, uh, Blues Brothers, the, the Blue Brother, we'll call him because he's you know a blue elephant, I suppose. Um, there you go. That's my Max Rebo story. That's my pitch. <laughs> How long <laughs> do you think they'll kick me out of the room really quick or something? No, no. They, I think they'll green light that at this point. Uh, I think they'll, <laughs> they'll, they, might, they might give you you know like a a, a mill, maybe two mil range. Uh, make make it a gritty independent film, you know, on the long, on the long lines <laughs> of the Blues Brothers, and I, I think you got it, man. And, and in fact, you know what? They're gonna say keep all that language in there, uh, <laughs> so, so it's gonna be completely different. <laughs> it'll it'll be so foul. <laughs> <laughs> Like the sexiest Star Wars movie ever, and they'll be like, uh, they'll have in the in the Jabba scene, we'll put all these little references to the uh, to the to the special editions. Where like that blue fuzzy thing starts singing, and then someone's like, oh, "Who's this guy? Who's this asshole? Was was he always here? Was he always in the band? <laughs> and since when did this singer get so much dexterity? She used to just be a little potato on toothpicks, and now she's running around, going up to cameras and blowing her lips. And like, what the fuck? What's yeah. going on in here? We used to be a band, goddammit. <laughs> if if oh. you pitch this to Kathleen Kennedy, I think she's going to say, "Here's what would happen." Okay, she'd say, "Everyone, can can you leave the room and, and just leave Mark and I?" To our to, by ourselves, and everyone's gonna oh, yeah. everyone's gonna go oh shit! So they're they're all gonna get up and slink out of the room, and, and she and they close the door right, and she looks at you and she says, "Mark, I'm glad that finally somebody has had the balls to come in here and tell me what it's really like." And she's like, "I love this thing. We're gonna give you the the, the X millions to make this." And she goes, "It's gonna be a Star Wars for a whole new generation. It's gonna be a punch to the gut." And if anyone doesn't like it, they can fuck off. <laughs> I'll say as well, we're going to put a Christmas tree in it, right? That makes it a Christmas movie. It means that every fucking Christmas is on. I'll have a lifetime's worth of residuals. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be perfect. I've got my Star Wars sequel planned. I, I, it'll, and any of that shit will translate to a Marvel movie either as well. So if they want me to make Stiltman, I'm like, yep, got it. Here's my idea. Stiltman has a band. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> it'll, it'll take off. It's going to be fine. I'm sorry, buddy. I'm waffling. Um... I should, I should, I should, I should, I should let you, I'm, I'm already sucking you away from your 4th of July celebrations uh, too much, so I'll, I'll be good and, and stay on target. No, well, I, I, all I'm going to do is work, so the only thing, the only thing you're, <laughs> there is no 4th of July celebrations for me today. I have oh. way, way too much work to get done, um, oh. but uh, I'm a workaholic. I'm, I'm one of those guys, uh, Mark, that'll be on my deathbed just wishing I worked more. Um, be like, I wish I had worked just that one extra hour. And then, I'll, uh, yeah. and then they'll finally just throw my body in the trash. Um, but, um, but, but you know, it, it, it was great talking about those Star Wars movies. Cause I, could, I could just imagine you at the bar or, or the pub uh, later on that night, and you're sitting yeah. there and, you're, and you're telling all your friends, you're like, listen, they actually bought that pitch. Now I'm, now you're like, I don't know what else to do now. Like, I have to actually make this thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't worry. <laughs> like, don't worry. We, we got you covered. And then it's uh, – it, it, and then it's just you know it can become a hit. It can just be just be the uh, the new Star Wars type. The, the, you know, take somebody from the background and make them the star of the next film. <laughs> exactly, it's just gonna go on like that. That's how so they all work though. It's fine. <laughs> oh man, yes. So, so so cool, Mark. You know, it's been a while since. I mean, I, you know, I'm just gonna keep rolling with this if you're happy with it. Like, totally, I, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, because I mean, honestly, I think this is hilarious so far. Um, so you know, the last time we talked, I mean, you made uh, Colin. 
which was right, yes. the, the, which was this well, you made it for 75 pounds right uh i was uh, i think it was 70 dollars uh was the line and then 45 pounds was the uk line there was a some conversion that went on there and um yeah so that was um but the, to be honest that was that's just a, that was if it cost that i mean it was a home movie made during a time when i was living up an overdraft and uh you know much younger and more uh had more ingenuity and, and so we just sort of made that movie without spending any money really and because it was a zombie movie the nature of the zombie movie allowed us to incorporate uh anything we could uh find and say isn't this a cool weapon brilliant let's use that so it kind of uh, it just sort of evolved really and the improvisational nature of how i like to make things anyway kind of carried forward and uh yeah and then we just sort of made that movie and uh yeah it somehow got released which is still crazy to me um yeah <laughs> Because I remember talking to people about that movie. I was at a networking party, and I said, "Man, you, you know, I, I just read about this zombie film called Colin, and it was made for, you know, like forty-five pounds, fifty pounds, and you know, it, it's getting rave reviews." And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what could they have done? And when I finally was able to see it, I was like, "You know what? This was fantastic." And I'm not just saying that because you're on the podcast, Mark. Um, cool, man. I, I was like, you know what? And, and so there's there's two zombie films of the past yeah. ten years that are worth anything. Yeah. Um, one is Colin. Yeah. And do you know what the other one is? Can you, do you want to take a guess? I want to say Zombieland because that was great. I, I love that. But oh, but you, you, I imagine it's probably something cooler that oh, I should oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 so it's the movie called The Battery. Oh, shit. I don't know that. So uh, Colin and The Battery, two zombie films, and they're the only zombie films of the past like 10 years, maybe even since the remake of Dawn of the Dead, that are actually worth anything. Um, I did not like Zombieland too much, by the way. Ah, cool. Hey, I'm looking at the battery now. Oh, shit, man. That, okay, that looks pretty sweet. Right, there we go. That's on the list. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the future, isn't it? You can, like, this is how this could go. Note how I didn't play this. I didn't say, oh, yeah, the battery, and then you just hear the sort of typing of the keyboard. I was like, I, I was honest. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, the battery, the, the, the personalities of two former trivia, all the canned foods, heinous shit. I read the synopsis. <laughs> I read the crop version. <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh no, this looks great. Um, ooh, I think I wonder if Good Bad Flicks covered this actually. Do you know there's a there's a YouTube channel called Good Bad Flicks I'm really into. Uh, great guy, he's he's got this a back catalog of really obscure movies that he always sort of uh, showcases. And although it's called Good Bad Flicks, he's not like he doesn't present them as oh it's so bad they're good. Uh, he just says I love this film because and and, he, and it's it's nice to see such in depth. You know, not pretending they're anything other than the films they are, but honest uh, sort of uh, reviews of, of these uh, really interesting movies that this, uh, you know, the, the guy who runs it, I think his name is Cecil, just loves. You know, they're, they're, their films are really personal that you grew up watching. And some of them are ones that I caught as well. So it's this great. I highly recommend the channel if you don't, um, if you haven't uh, subscribed already. It's, uh, I'll put that in the link in the show notes. I haven't actually checked out that channel, um, but I, I definitely will. Because uh, I'm glad you clarified that too, by the way. Because sometimes when I when I see channel names, you know, uh, I kind of go, well, you know, I could take this a number of different ways. Because uh, you know, language isn't perfect, and uh, English, uh, as we both know, has so much slang in it that sometimes you're like, is ba-? when they say bad, then does that mean good? Or you know, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the point, actually. Like, I, I, shit, were you rolling when I was slinging? Very insensitive swear words around. <laughs> I was like, I, I apologize. <laughs> I'm going to try and hold back on some of the c words, um, but uh, you know, my best friend's a Cockney and an Irishman, so you know, it's like saying shit to me now. It's it's not <laughs> the, the impact's gone. Um, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the podcast is uncensored. Um, you know. And, yes. and I mean, and, and the British are known for their sense of humor. Uh, in fact, you know, let me let me just rephrase that: the entire United Kingdom should be <laughs> is more known for their uh, their sense of humor. Yes, of course, yes. It's, well, well, British is good because I guess I fall into that. It, you know, that we we you know <laughs> we couldn't make the escape that you guys could that you're <laughs> celebrating today. Uh, no, the Welsh were we're all we're all under the English. Uh, we I mean, I believe we tried, uh, and then we just like, hey, look, guys, this just you know this. What, what's the divide really and then i think we all just got along although we have our own government now yeah. <laughs> it's uh we're, we're still part of the uk 
So it's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know the Scot, the Scottish, the Northern Irelands, uh, the Nor- the Northern Ireland, Northern Irish, and the you know the Welsh and uh, the British. You know, uh, all known for their sense of humor. Uh, so it's, yes. it's all it's all good. So uh, that's so why I, I think people would understand. Uh, by yeah. the way, are, are you impressed that I, I actually knew what the UK was? Well, I would have been, but you told me this morning that your mother was Welsh, so now I expect you to know everything okay. well, my, my, <laughs> about, about, about how the, the UK is all divided up. <laughs> well, my, my, it was my grandmother. She, she's actually Welsh. Oh, it's your grandmother. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah, she actually uh, came. She actually came over. Uh, 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 you know, directly. She, you know, she came over when I, I don't know how old she was, but uh, yeah, she she uh, came over directly from from Wales and came over and. Uh, you know, started a whole life here, and uh, if you ever saw me, by the way, I, you know, people ask me what my genetic makeup is, and when I tell them, they're like, no, it's no, don't, don't even try it, because I'm actually like 15% uh, Cherokee Indian, uh, Cherokee right. Native American, but I don't look like it at all. I look, I look, I look exactly like you do. Uh, you know, like some, 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 just a, a ginger Welsh guy. You know, it's uh, well, not that you're ginger, but you know what I mean. I'm, I'm not, I'm not. I have a nephew who is. It's. Uh... Shit, this is, makes me look like a terrible uh, uncle. I think he is. I mean, he looked ginger. He looks ginger. He, he looks ginger when I generally cast my eye over the other end of the room, and I'm like, "What's that noise?" Oh yeah, you're there. Okay, you know, here's some matches. Play with those. You know, your uncle's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> is, is he around here somewhere? I don't know. Uh, nah, it's um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this isn't. This is only funny to me. This is not funny to anyone. No one knows who I'm related to. This is a terrible angle to try to get a laugh. No, I, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> gingers don't have souls, so you can't give them matches because you know they like, God only knows what they're going to get into. <laughs> exactly, there's only one way to find out. <laughs> like I keep saying, when I get really, really sick, like terminal sick, these are the guys that are going to have to be pumping me full of heroin on my last few days, just so it doesn't, you know, itch or whatever cancer does, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was wrong, was it? <laughs> like, it, uh, I, like I, this is how I'm choosing to face the death that uh, you know may creep around the corner at any point with to laugh to laugh in the face of death. You, you, um, you have to, Mark, and and also they, they could have like you know great new designer drugs, and you're gonna be like, no, 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 I want the heroin, just give it to me. Yeah, I mean, it's the future diseases I'm gonna die from, the ones that turn us into zombies. Like that would suck, man have some semblance of consciousness as I'm running around like snarling and spewing blood all over some, you know, attractive young fucking person who survives this sort of shit. You know, I've, I've got zombie written all over me. Like in, in, in a, in a post apocalypse, I'm, I'm fucked. <laughs> like I've got, I can contribute nothing. I'm like, I'm going to have to align myself with the strongest and, and try and do something to try and make sure that I'm not too lowly, that I get sent out on raids to fight mutants. In the desert, which I'll, I'm not used to deserts, you know, but in, I imagine the desert is going to be everywhere because that's how apocalypses work and I'll be stuck. Yeah, I'm not a hero in a zombie movie. I'm definitely a zombie and a shit one too. And I'm just such a throwaway kill. I'm not even a memorable kill. I'm not a screwdriver in the ear or anything like that. I'm just a sort of like, bam, kill, dead, moving on, you know. <laughs> it's... Yeah, it's like when the the horde of zombies comes in one of those movies, and you've got and the the hero has like a Gatling gun and just goes. <laughs> you're one of those guys, and just like for a split second, I think like, I think that was Mark. I can't tell. All right, moving on. Everyone's looking at my digital arm that got blown off. Yeah, that's what everyone's looking at. No one's even looking at me. <laughs> I, oh. I don't even have I don't even have good makeup. Like I don't have season fucking eight whatever seasons we're on Walking Dead level makeup. I've got like. Season two ran out of money. Only two or three complicated ones. The rest of them are just dude shambling makeup. That's what I'll have. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I had a friend of mine who just, who just shot a zombie film, and he had that. He had the, he had the, the tears. So he said, if you're in the foreground, you're in, in a zombie, and you get the most makeup. Uh, if you're a B zombie, you get like a uh, somewhat good makeup. And then if you're a C zombie, he said somebody just comes by and throws blood on you, and they call it a day. <laughs> we we had a similar system on Colin and uh, and anything else I've done with zombies where we have um, gold zombies, which now means they get some prosthetic work. Uh, we have uh, silver zombies, which are your standard like you know heavy latex stuff. Uh, bronze zombies, which are just like the the one you described. Then we have lead zombies, which is just someone further back nothing on them just shambling and making a shape for their body so like uh and then i never necessarily even keep them in the right order so they're mixed up all over the place so it's just a mess but um, which you might have seen in the clip i sent uh actually that was the last zombie thing we did um which was uh 
the film within a film for night shooters, uh, which I, I thought would be a really fun way to sort of open the movie. And so, so we do, we open with a, a, a big violent zombie action sequence. Well, you know, I was going to ask about that because I, I, I was saying to myself, you know, I know what the synopsis of the film is. And I was like, wow, you know, uh, maybe something happens, but it's good you mentioned that. And, and so, so let, let's start talking about, you know, uh, before we talk about night shooters, actually, let, let's just finish that thought about Colin. When you actually release Colin, you know, yeah. did that did that open any more doors for you? Did we, were you just like, you know, inundated with like different people approaching you about, about projects and such? Um, yeah, I mean, the, I think a lot of work sort of happened after that. And then I think from that point, I think I was a little bit nervous to sort of quit the day job, really. So I, I sort of, because I had a really lovely uh, sort of like um, late at night evening job where it was just me and one other guy and we were running uh, this sort of courier company. And then there are car service as well, like a prestige car service. So I was in the office there. So that's where I was sort of just doing everything, really. And it was, um, I was just a little bit nervous to leave because that was a lovely job and everyone there was really supportive and really, you know, I was able to just do whatever I wanted to do, provided, you know, I, I answered the phones when they rang. Um, and, and yeah, so, but when I eventually did sort of leave, um, that was the scariest part because I was essentially going freelance. And yeah, and, and, and but from then, everything, there was always some work. It's just, uh, it, it took a lot of getting used to that that work isn't always there. <laughs> so you have to you sometimes go a little bit of a period where there isn't much, um, but that's when you are able to live off the last job you did. So there's lots of little bits of work there, really, but I, I tended to do a lot more stuff that was in development, and um, and I was really content. I mean, uh, none of it got made. And I think after about, I think after about three years, I started to go, oh, Jesus, I should probably make something because, uh, it, you know, <laughs> you've got to sort of try and keep the fires burning um if that makes any sense. And and so that was the thing that I was always, I started to get a little bit worried about. And then, uh, yeah, we just started making things. So I made a, a low budget film called Magpie. Um, and then, um, uh, and, and I mean, that did okay. It did fine. We got a little US release for that. A uh, very small release, but a very nice release. And after that, uh, I, I got stuck into another film, which I'm not, uh, we, we won't talk about because I got fired from that movie. And I don't want to give them any, un any undue, uh, press attention but uh i got kicked off that movie and then whilst i was running around trying to get another one made uh which turned out to be night shooters um yeah there's just there was always work in between so there was commercial work and uh you know uh little pilots here and there that I was asked to direct so it's, it's always it's, it's been it's been work but it's you know it's a scary bit of work it's not uh it's not the sort of work that makes you go, ah, oh, great, <laughs> I can relax now. It's the sort of work that makes you go, oh, God, I hope there's something after this. <laughs> how am I going to make rent next month? <laughs> so things like that, really. So so the, the I mean, I know we, we you don't want to mention the, the movie title, but you know, <laughs> w what happens, though? Well, I just, you know, j just out of my own curiosity uh, and, and also, j you know, just to as a learning experience, I mean, when, whenever you get fired from something like that, you know what I mean? Like, it, you know, two things. I mean, did you? I, I don't want to say. Well, did they give you a reason as to why they were why you, they were letting you go? Oh yeah, it was. Um, it was. It's all, it was definitely a politics thing. Um, so, so to talk around it whilst talking about it, because you know it's gossip and it's fun, isn't it? So, um, uh, what happened was I was uh, I, I was asked to. Uh, I, I agreed to edit the film. And I, uh, my fee was very, very low. Uh, and I said, look, I'll just do this. And, and if you pay me that fee, I'll edit it. I'm the best person to edit it. And, you know, I, I was given a good amount of time to edit it. But, I, and, you know, and I got it done. And, and um, but, you know, we needed a lot of pickups. There were a lot of things that the production company failed to come through on that we asked for that were sort of minimum requirements. So you're making the film without some of those things. And, and, you know, I'm not the sort of person to complain. So I don't even really know if they were that aware of how much of a problem that was. It didn't really come up, but they were fine with me shooting pickups, which is where we we're going to make up for some of that stuff. Um, so it was all fine. Um, but I think that uh, the, I, I'd invoiced for my fee to edit because I'd, I was very careful about, um, you know, not taking work so I could concentrate on that. And I said, look, I need to invoice for this now. And um, although it wasn't part of the agreement, you know, the, 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 the comeback was, oh, you know, we pay you when you finish the film and i said well no that wasn't the agreement the agreement was this so, okay fine well we'll pay you now if and then there were a bunch of new terms that were conditioned on that payment and i said well i'm not going to agree to any new terms as a condition of payment for work that i've already done 
but I'm happy to have these conversations, but they have to be a separate conversation because there were things I think that were left out of the contract. I don't think a delivery date was in a contract, for, for example, and it was something they wanted in, which is fair enough. But I just wasn't going to have that on condition of something. And also there are little things like I think their visual effects company had not given me anything. Their sound department had not given me anything. And I'm not responsible for those departments. So if the film isn't delivered because those departments were pretty unresponsive, well, I'm kind of like, well, hang on. I'm in, I'm in trouble then. And I don't really – so I'm not going to sign anything that means I'm responsible for that when that's not even my company. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, I, I, so that was my reason. I said, look, these new terms I'm not going to – I'm not going to – agree to anything as a condition of payment but i'm happy to discuss it in another way and and the response was there will be no discussion services no longer required i thought oh surely that's surely they don't mean that because it's going to cost them a lot of money to finish this film now because you know the pickups weren't going to cost anything um and uh but no that that, that stuck and i was like oh interesting <laughs> and uh so uh, so i just thought of, uh, i just thought shit i need to get another film made um Mainly just because you know I put a lot of I put a lot of heart and soul into that film. We, I got a great cast together. We made some really nice stuff. I think some of the best directing I've done is in that film, um, and uh, and and I just kind of felt like shit. I need to I need to make something else. So I was in a bit of a mad panic to get Night Shooters done, and, and so Night Night Shooters. Uh, so the, that landed at the same time as this Western Fistful of Lead, um, and. <laughs> I spoke to my producer, who is amazing. I said, I think, I think we can do these. I think I can do both of these. I can, we'll do this one, and then I'll be deep in post on that, and then we'll start shooting the other one, and then it'll all be fine. And, and it has been fine. Uh, I finished Night Shooters uh, this week. Um, we just got to sort of find out where we're going to get the DCP made for it. And then that's it. I sort of take it over and say, here you go make a movie out of this and, and, and we're done uh and then i spend the next few weeks now finishing up fistful of lead uh then i get that to the um the colorist and the we're working on the sound and we're gonna get the visual effects done yeah it should it should all come together quite nicely so by the end of this month i should have two features under my belt um which is fun uh it's tiring but it's fun so you know i was gonna say uh either you're not sleeping or, or you're either like a raging alcoholic at this point, Mark. So <laughs> it's like one oh, or the sh- other. Shit, I'm drinking cider right now. It's not 10 a.m. here, incidentally. <laughs> Which, you, you know that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm an alcoholic yet, but it, it does seem very appealing. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been very... Uh, busy but uh i mean the interesting thing about when you're doing a film as quickly as doing night show is is you look at that and you, you i haven't had time to watch the film as a whole so i'm so busy working all the minutiae you know and, and and all the little teeny bits and the connective tissue and all those things just sort of come together and uh, i think i saw it for the first time from beginning to end a couple of weeks ago and it was it was it was a, it was a really fun experience for me because you know you know coming back to the alcoholism and i made sure i'd had a couple of beers first and uh and i was i was watching with my girlfriend who worked on the film she's um sort of the atmospherics and, and uh special effects department and uh I, I i just really enjoyed the film we made i was like oh jesus i thought i hated this you know because you do you you fall out of love with these things you, you see all the holes and and then to see it flow like that i was i was surprised at how uh, how everything seemed to slot into place in the way that you hope and you work towards. And um, and we watched it again on Sunday because I had uh, what was close to the final sound mix. So I had some friends around to watch it. And um, it was great watching their reactions to it because you see their faces screw up at the right moments and then they laugh at the right moments. And, and, and it's, it's really nice just to see them reacting exactly how you hope people will react when those moments occur. And from a filmmaking perspective, I mean, that's all I can do. That's all I can do is, 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 is make the audience react a certain way at a certain moment. And then after that, whether they liked it or not, that's beyond my control. There's nothing I can do about that. So I, I, I you know, but, but if I can at least make them in that moment go, or yes, or ha ha, you know, there's, there's, there's something. Um, so that's all I can really work towards. So that's all I really concentrate on. So it's really nice to see, even though it was a small room, just a few people to see that, um, that reaction. It was lovely. Yeah, I mean it, that's what you're always hoping for. Um, because somebody once said there, there's there's two ways you want someone to like to, to take your movie. Either they love it or they hate it. Because the worst thing you can do is they they're just t- completely benign to the whole thing. 
Um, and he said that that's the worst spot to be in, no matter what. You know what? I was, I was speaking. I was speaking to another filmmaker because what we do on our films is we have a lot of uh, young people work on them. Um, I think it's really important to to get young people working on films because I mean, I, I, I coming from Swansea. Uh, I didn't really feel that there was, there, there weren't many, there were lovely people in Swansea who did encourage me, uh, but there were a lot of people who, were, the, the general reaction was, what, what what do you want to do that for? Why do you get a real job and, and work really hard and get up early and then go to bed early and, and live for the weekend and then have a family? Like, why, why don't you just, why, why do you want to do this ambitious thing? It, 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 you're considered a little bit strange for, for wanting something that's a little bit different to the norm. Um, and, you know, not to knock any of those things. I kind of think, you know, like raising a family is a very admirable thing because it's something, uh, you know, that that I'm, I'm not doing, you know, uh, but I see my brother doing it and it's incredible. And I know that my parents, you know, I was part of that and it was fantastic. So, you know, it's it's just this really, you know, it's it's it's, it's something I, ad, I admire, but I've chosen the more selfish life of, of, of making films. And, you know, um, so there, there's a, it's a really interesting thing back in Swansea where I kind of find that, there, there wasn't much support for making films, and so I think it's really important when there's young filmmakers to 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 say, look, it's worth exploring to its fullest before you move on from this. So we always, uh, you know, uh, as part of work experience, we get a lot of young people working on the film, and we give them proper roles. They're not making tea or coffee for us. They're they're script supervising or they're camera assistants and first first ACs as well. They're not. Um, you know, a runner for the camera department. So it's, uh, we, we, we do a lot for, for those guys. And yeah, I think that it's, it's, you know, I, I, to me, that's one of the most important aspects of, of, of making these movies. And I've always, is, is, is making sure that the people who are working for you feel like they're part of the film, because what happens then is that everyone throws in and you end up with a really, it's like, it's like a community <laughs> where everyone wants the film to work. Uh, everyone's all on the same team. It's, um, like I, I love that that feeling of making a film. I think I've gone on a tangent here, and I forgot where I was going with it. But uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, David. No, 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 it, no it, it's all it's all good, Mark. Believe me, um, I, I know what you mean, man. I, I actually do both. I, I actually work the day job, uh, like I was telling you before, um, mm. and I, you know, I get up every day at four a.m. Um, regardless, I get up at four a.m. I got up at four a.m. today, and I was off today, um, just so I could try to get some extra work. I get work in before I go to work. Um, and then when I'm at the, you know, then I come home and I start doing the the other work again, uh, trying to trying to keep the ends bur- both ends burning at the same time. Um, yeah. But I but the whole family thing, I don't know how people do it. When you add that equation in there, um, I couldn't even fathom how some people do it because that's burning it at three ends. Then. Oh, it's amazing. Like I, I think I know what Ty it is working on these movies. Uh, my brother's. <laughs> He's like, oh, you don't know what tight is. You wait till you have two kids. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, like I, 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 and I, but I, you know, I see a really happy family and it's amazing. I was like, oh, well, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. I just think that like, you know, me and my brother have gone in different directions in terms of what we're trying to get out of life. I find what my brother's doing far more admirable than what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm playing. I play games. That's my job. My job is to play games in a way where, people look at that and instead of going aren't you a bit old to play games they look at that and go oh man that's cool <laughs> you make movies and it's like well yeah okay <laughs> i don't know that was never the plan i was just like oh, i just want to do this this seems like fun and i enjoy doing it and i want to be better and you learn and you grow and all those things sort of um come together i think yeah yeah and and, and you know I, I wanted to talk more about nice shooters too um, mm. so could you just give a, a brief synopsis of the film uh, the film's about a group of low-budget filmmakers who are shooting pickups. Uh, they've broken into a building that turns out that it's uh, rigged for demolition. Um, so they've snuck in, and the director... Uh, well, the term is the term is gaslighting now. Uh, the director kind of gaslights uh, a bunch of his crew with just working in a building that's rigged for demolition. And uh, whilst working on their movie, shooting their pickups, they see... Uh, they witness a murder in the building opposite. Uh, the murder is being committed by uh, a gangster who owns the demolition company that's leveling the buildings. The idea is you kill people in the buildings, the buildings collapse on them, and the bodies are buried. Uh, and, oh, there were people in here is the, <laughs> is, 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 is the idea. Um, so uh, they have to use their filmmaking skills as weapons to survive the constant onslaught from gangsters who are trying to eradicate any witnesses, uh, make sure they're dead. And then leave them in the buildings to get demolished. So uh, yeah, it's uh, 
it's fun. The stunt, the, the stunt guy is a martial artist. The special effects lady takes the plastic explosives from the rigged building to create more dangerous explosives using her squibs. Um, the sound guy is leaving radio mics everywhere so we can hear when the bad guys are coming. Uh, the cinematographer knows the layout of the buildings perfectly because she has uh, kind of studied them for all the best angles. Uh, yeah, little things like that. <laughs> it's uh, it's a, a, sort of a fun concept. That's as much of a love letter to filmmaking as it is films themselves and uh even in the sound design we were able to throw in a couple of familiar sound effects uh that people might clock and go ah the world they live in now has these sound effects from films not the wilhelm scream though we didn't do that one <laughs> the wilhelm scream that's like a uh, a staple that's like a staple I, of so many movies in fact i think it was in uh the last jedi uh, it better have been. I think it's in all the Star Wars movies. It should be. It's 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 in all of the Lucasfilm movies. I think it's in uh, Willow a couple of times. It's in uh, all the Indiana Jones movies. Uh, it's yeah. It's uh, it's it's one I've always loved. It used to terrify me as a kid because <laughs> it sounded so anguished and pained. But as an adult, it's it's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, it's always something. It always just makes me laugh whenever I hear it. I know it's in a lot of Tarantino films too. Um, but uh, I'm going to link that into the show notes, everybody, for anyone who doesn't know cool. what the Wilhelm scream is. But uh, but but for for night shooters, you know, how did you go about you know, putting this all together? I mean, you know, did did you have to did you go with the team to sort of find an abandoned building that you could actually shoot in, or or even semi abandoned, or one hell one that was actually fully operational? You know, so how did you go about you know, <laughs> starting to put all this together? We actually found a building that was due to be demolished in our third week of shooting. So uh, we said, yeah, we'll take it. And uh, my amazing producer worked really really hard to try and convince them to let us stay there because the building doesn't just get destroyed it gets you know there's a degree of tidying up electronics come out all that sort of thing and and that's when <clears throat> that's when that you know so there's about a, there's about two weeks worth of that that would have happened before we would have needed to get out of there so we were trying to sort of talk ourselves and talk our way into it which she did actually and we managed to get the full three weeks there um, the only problem we had was on the last day it snowed, so we had to shoot some stuff in January. But uh, yeah, it was uh, we, <laughs> it was great because the building was going to be demolished. I was like, "Can I just trash this place?" And they went, "Yeah, if you sign something, it says we're not responsible if someone hurts themselves. You can do whatever you want." And they were like, "Okay, great." So uh, yeah, we we wrecked the place. There was one room we shot in, uh, and then we thought, "Look, this is a good room. The lights are here. Let's smash down this wall." And now it's sudden and put the cameras over here and now it's suddenly a new set, right? And we're like, yep, great. So we uh, spent like 10 minutes throwing ourselves into walls to try and tear the place apart. And it worked quite well. <laughs> it was a good way to get some frustration out of our systems. It was about week, it was day five, I think, at that point. We we're like, it's, it's, and we were shooting actual nights. Um, I remember saying to everyone, oh, it'll be great. We'll just adjust and then we'll be fine and we'll shoot. And I think on night three, I turned to, um, uh, this, this, uh, the special effects department who were also my girlfriend and just said, I fucked up. I fucked up so bad. This is really hard. I don't know how the fuck I'm going to do this for another two and a half weeks. Um, but uh, we did and it was fine. Um, of course, I couldn't say that to anyone else because that would have been poor leadership. Um, but my God, I, <laughs> I, I remembered working nights when I was in my early 20s and thought, yeah, you just get used to it. It's fine. Oh man, it's different when you're nearly 40. <laughs> it's a much different experience. So, I mean, do you find that sometimes, I mean, you know, really, do you, does anybody ever, ever really get used to those long days? Um, I, I've, I've kind of gotten used to them in a way, um, but, but some days when you're on set for, you know, 14, 16, 18 hours, you're like, you know, I thought I'd be used to this by now if they were doing it for five, 10 years, but it's like, you know what I yeah. mean? It just kind of never, never really sinks. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, uh, the thing is from, from where I am, because you're always fighting a schedule that's really difficult. The days always seem quite short from my perspective. I was like, we never seem to have enough time. And only when life is like that do you go, ah, ah. And so the nights would fly by pretty quickly for me. I think there was only one day, and this is when we switched, and because on Saturdays, because uh, it was a part of a complex, a business complex, so we had to shoot at night just for the noise, really, and because, you know, to block out the windows on some of these buildings was a huge ordeal. So we, was, so we would just shoot at night. We could just move around, go to wherever we wanted at any point, and we didn't have to spend 
uh, 40 minutes each setup blocking out lights. So it was, it was, it was just, it, it, it did make sense to shoot at night. It wasn't just for the sake of it. <clears throat> and, um, but yeah, it, it was, uh, on sat on this, we had two Saturdays where we worked during the days or they were later days. And, uh, one of those was the hardest. I was, I, I think I just didn't get much sleep the sort of day before. Um, so I, yeah, I think I, I, I said to my producer and my script supervisor, I said, guys, I need you guys to drive time today because I, I can't, I, I am just so tired. I'm going to concentrate on what I'm doing and I'll make sure that works. And then we're going to move on to the next thing. I don't really want to think about time or any of those things. So you guys come to me and tell me that we need to get a move on. Otherwise, I'm just going to assume we're fine and just keep going. And that day worked really well. Uh, it was fine. I kind of got through that one, slept very quickly when I got home. But um, oof, that was a... That was the hardest one. That was the hardest day um, because it was a day, ironically. If it was another night, I think I would have been fine. <laughs> <clears throat> but, but you know, it, it's in those moments, man, that, that's when you need to have that team. You know what I mean? Like it, you, you kind of want – you know what I mean? Like that, that's when a team can actually come together and that's when you're like, man, I'm glad I've always been – you know, tried to be a good guy or whatever because now I'm just going to have to count on, these, on the team a lot right now. Um, and not, you know what I mean? And, and it's in those, yeah. those times where you're like, thank God I wasn't a freaking tyrant. Or maybe you were, Mark. I don't know. <laughs> maybe you were. <laughs> it might have been like, oh, he's all right, except for this making us work night shit. <laughs> but, yeah. um, they they were still... like, these, these guys, they, actually, they were amazing. They were all really, really great for me. Um, I, I, one of the things I tend to notice is that, I mean, I, I don't think I get, you know, there's always a moment where pressure and, and time and all those things are compressed. And what you end up with is um, – what I end up with is more of an urgency to get things done. So I think uh, whereas my normal approach is to be kind of like very excited and, and happy and, and, you know, like a child basically, when it comes to those moments, I tend to get more, I think, focused. So I tend to sometimes um, – I'll, I'll just <clears> – sometimes it doesn't come across as like I'm having a good time. And I think that when those moments do crop up, I notice that everyone – really really everyone really works anyway but i do notice a change in that everyone works to try to get me excited again <laughs> if that makes any sense and and the way i've always interpreted that is that i'm obviously doing something where they like me being happy and enjoying what we're getting <laughs> like i i think that there's something there and then what they're trying to do is get that back i think that's just how i've interpreted it because and that feels to me that feels lovely that feels like I've got a group of people who aren't just helping me make a film or, or to tell a story, but you know, they want me to enjoy myself as I'm doing it. And uh, like I said, a lot of these guys are really young. Some of them are more experienced. Um, and, and it's just really great when that group of people come together because they see that I'm frustrated or disappointed because something isn't working and they find a way to make it work or they're offering solutions. I and mean, if you think about it like this, if I was like a complete like vicious asshole during a shoot, like a young person isn't going to make a suggestion to me that can save the, save the day. They're going to think, oh, he's a, he's, he's a bit grumpy. I don't want to really, I don't want him snapping at me. So they'd keep quiet, but they don't. Like, you know, when I'm stuck for a problem, I've got people throwing ideas at me. And it's like, that's great. That's what I need. I need solutions to problems, not, you know, a bunch of people are scared to speak up because I'm having a tantrum and because I'm in a building where I can actually literally smash a wall. I'm not smashing a wall, you know, um, which psychologically isn't healthy, by the way. If you do take out your rage by breaking things or damaging things, what you do is you condition yourself to need to do that whenever you're in uh, a moment of heightened stress. And that's not healthy. Um, I don't know. I've read that a while ago. I'm not sure if that's true anymore. You know, it's like with psychological uh, <laughs> theory, it's always changing. And uh, but um, <laughs> I, I did hear that. But I thought, well, nevertheless, it's a very unpleasant thing to see. <laughs> so, so I, so I, 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 I don't do it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's really lovely that, that I think everyone sort of comes comes through. And, and you know, I think we had a really great team on this one. We had a really good cast. Everything was um, like exceeded expectations so much um and, you know it was, it was a tough shoot but i think what we've got is is a fun film that that, that you know seems to make sense and and the, you know, the action's really good fun and the characters are, are great um i really love uh I, I love tonal shifts so there's lots of those in the movie um 
So yeah, it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's it's a weird one. It's the kind of one of the first times I've talked about it. Uh, it's just weird because I've been making it for so long, and the people I've been interacting with are, are part of that, or that people have been sending clips to all along who have read the script. And this is the first time I've kind of t- spoken about it, sort of without anyone having that frame of reference or context. So I hope it's making sense. Uh, if it's not, you just get me. Let me know. And and I'll uh, with your permission, Mark. I'm gonna post a link to the trailer or if it, if it's up yet, um, or maybe even a still if it's not up yet, uh, just so there's a frame of reference so people aren't like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a still because this is gonna. Oh, this is this, <laughs> this is an awkward one. There is a trailer, but I I I I, I it's yeah it's it's oh god. Uh, this happens all the time, right? Directors don't like trailers they see for their films. Like surely that happens all the time. This is, I've, I've heard it discussed a lot of times. Um, I, I don't think the trailer represents the film very well. Um, uh, you know, it, it's interesting because, like, because you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being as diplomatic as I can. Do. The guys who make the film obviously want the film to do really well, and they care a lot about the film. Um, the guys who have sort of like been, been financing it, but also they're distributing it, and they they know their audience. They know the audience they want to capture, and that's fine. I, I can understand they can get behind it, but. Um, and I know they worked hard in the trailer to, to achieve what they want to achieve. It's just that it's 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 just not, um, I I I just it's not one that I'm particularly keen on. I don't think I think it undersells the film criminally, and uh, uh, yeah, and I haven't really made any secret about it. I mean, I wasn't really involved in the in the construction of the trailer at all. Um, and even from a technical perspective, the way I shot that film to specifically be graded, no one asked me about that either. Um, but this is the difference from the film that I guess I was kicked off. And this film is that for this film, we made sure that all the things are in place so that I, it was like we own the film and we've given it to distributors. So we, it's our film to make, really. It's just been financed. Um, so that's kind of where it is, really. Um, yeah, I'm trying not to be a dick because you know these guys, these guys help me make a film. You know, it's like I, I, I've, I've got nothing but like appreciation for for what they've done. It's just that I, I do also, you know, have an idea of how the thing should be marketed, and and, and their idea of how it should be marketed and mine are very, very different. Um, and that that's all. It's just it's just a it's, it's basically it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a it's a pull in two different directions. It's it's there's 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 nothing but sort of support and love for the film. And, you know, I think these guys, you know, I'll be forever in debt at them because I've been able to make a film that's really close to my heart and really personal out of it. Um, I just want people to see it, you know. <laughs> that's, uh, that's where the marketing comes in. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the uh, big thing nowadays is, you know, how, how do you actually get people to see your movie? Uh, you know, you, you, things have gotten, you know, I don't want to say easier, but let's just say more accessible uh, to filmmakers. Yeah. And, you know, now it's like, well, we've made the thing. Now how do we get people to see the thing? Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, is it VOD, is it theaters, uh, do we slap it on YouTube and call it a day? Um, yeah. you know, and, and that's where this distribution, you know, that's why it's so important now more than ever. And yeah. you know, the movie has to be able to stand out. The, the marketing has to be able to stand out. Uh, because I mean, now it's, I, I think things have gotten, it's, it's more like you have to market instead of trying to do it like the old days where you have to market to everybody and say, yeah. okay. And then the chips will fall where they may. Now you have to market specifically to that group of yeah. people who are going to see it, and yes, that's yes. where all this big data comes in. That's where the the changing paradigms of social media come in, um, and then you know, and then you can you know basically now you can either create that market for yourself or you can pay to have access to that market. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's the thing. It's it's about um, you know it. it it's it's I mean the, the thing with the marketing is you know there there are elements in the film and uh, like you know you 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 saw Colin I, I, sh- I should have sent you a link from Magpie really Magpie is probably the best example of what some of this stuff can be like that I make where I really play with um, tone not to a point where it's incongruous like you um, um, you're not laughing at a scene you shouldn't be laughing at or you're not forced to laugh when you've just had like a terrible time or the other way around um, it's 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 tonal shift it's what Hitchcock did does perfectly uh, did perfectly it's what spielberg does perfectly and you know it's that idea of of, of taking over and so, so what happens is when you sell a film or a distributor has a film they find an angle in there that they find most appealing that they then think will help sell the film so you know action being a great one um it's not an action film we've got a lot of action in it uh but it's it's a, you know it's a character ensemble really the action is is, is a small part of the film i think if people went into this expecting to see the raid they'd be pretty pissed off because 
you know, the raid is 40 minutes of awesome fighting. We really don't have that long, that much. Um, so it's, it's, it's about sort of like, I think, from my perspective as an audience, I'm always thinking about measuring expectations. Um, I, I, I default to what the marketing team do. For, for Fistful of Lead, for example, Sony know exactly how they want to market that. And, you know, this isn't one of their big budget films. This is one of this is a completely different thing to Ghostbusters. You know what I mean? So it's not, you know, we're not going to fall into the same traps that Ghostbusters fell into. They've said to me, would you like to cut a trailer? And I say, I'd absolutely love to. And they said, okay, we've got one request. Can you make it longer than you'd normally make a trailer so that we have all of what you think are the best trailer moments and then we'll whittle it down. I was like, well, that's, that sounds great. Yeah, of course, I'll do that. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of like, they've got a very... Um, uh, like director driven approach to how the film can get out there, uh, which we did on Colin and it worked really well for Colin. You know, I was, I was, you know, very specific about what I think we should market the film towards. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, and it helped, it helped with sales. So, you know, so I think that's how I feel with Nightshoes. Like um, is I just, I, I want to, I want the film to be seen for what it's going to be. And, you know, like, <laughs> I, I you know, I'd like to send you the trailer that I cut for the film um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. I love watching people watch it. It's, uh, But uh, I think what we're going to do is, because I think it's fair that I don't interfere with the marketing that they've put money into. You know, I think we should, I think I should leave it, do its thing. And then when the film's released, then we're in a different territory. Then we can sort of, then we can release the trailer. Although I guess, I don't know, I suppose maybe I could put, because cause you're the US, this is a UK distributor. The US is a completely different market. We, we haven't sold the film to the US yet. I, I'm sure I could give you my trailer and say, well, here's my trailer. You know, it's, and, and I think regionally speaking, no one can do, you know, I, I don't think it's a problem. I'd have to check. <laughs> but, but, but like, cause, you know, what, what's the harm going to be if someone from the UK sees our trailer and go, whoa, that looks amazing. <laughs> you know, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, yeah. but um, I don't know. It'd be great if we could. Um, hey, it's great. You can tell by just scrolling down right now. If it's there, it was fine. If it's not, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, we're, it, we're in the past right now, Dave. Everyone listening to this is in the future. Exactly, I know. It, it, we would think you were, we're in the present, but we're not. We're actually, you know, it, it's it's amazing. Uh, I will I, after we're done uh, with this interview, I'm gonna uh, I'll look at it and I'll and I'll give you uh, and I'll tell you my thoughts. Um, I'll give you the thumbs up uh, uh, cool. and say, hey, you know what? I think I I'm, I'm gonna post this everywhere now, Mark. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That'd be amazing. And be, and, be, and, be like, and be like distributors, be damned. But. Uh, <laughs> But, but you, you know, when, when so I gotta, I gotta be, I've got to be clear with them. They mean well. That's the thing. It's not oh, like yeah, they're, yeah. they're not they're not like they're not bad people. They mean well. They want the film to succeed. It's just that they have their very specific ideas in the same way as I have my specific ideas. It doesn't make me right. My trailer could suck. But, you know, I, I you know, it, this this is the push and pull. And that's, that's the thing with the creative industry is that you're always talking about. Um, I always try to break it down to technique technicalities like i don't look at it as like on an emotional basis say emotionally i like this emotionally i don't like this i look at it and i break it down technically i say right what is this achieving is this story point clear is this story point clear here's a joke is that joke established well enough early in the trailer for it to work at this point in the trailer if the answer is no well we might have a problem (laughs) so so what i try to do with my trailers is try to make sure that all those components are in place so that we're telling a story and we have that emotional weight to it, so people do watch it and laugh. People are thrilled. That's that's what you're trying to do, and it's the same thing as making a film. You know, I was trusted with the money to make the film and tell that story. Why not trust me to do the mini version of that? You know, so I'm not exactly the director who says you can't put this in; it'll spoil it. I say, fuck it, spoil the whole thing. The audience may never. This is the thing that most people are going to see. This trailer. So you have to do it in a way that gets them in. And if the film's good enough, they will forget all of these little clips, because these clips out of context don't mean anything, it's just flashbang and cool. But in the context of the story of the film, people will forget that they know what's coming and they'll just enjoy it. Like, do you remember Return of the King? Um, yeah. Did you, did you, did you, did you I love the Lord of the Rings movies. In Return of the King, there was that amazing end to the trailer with the, you know, the fell beast sort of comes in and roars a Gandalf on the horse. And I had, I think I, someone pointed out that that wasn't in the film and I went, oh shit, yeah, that isn't in the film. I, I was so into the movie that I forgot that the coolest part of that trailer wasn't in the film. And I didn't even think to ask where it was. I mean, I just loved the film that much. So that's, you can do what you want in the trailer. It's fine. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah. I was starting to think of bad trailers and they give the whole thing away. That Terminator Genesis trailer. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I remember the poster gave that away too. Uh, you know, I, I, I actually have an idea for a, a movie. Uh, yes. A movie trailer, a movie trailer, and it's just called Bait and Switch. Like, literally, it's going to be a trailer for a movie that doesn't exist, which features uh, scenes from a, from a movie that if you were to go to it, it doesn't exist either. So what I mean by that is, it's like, imagine a, a, a trailer that showcases a movie that nothing, it has nothing to do with the movie they're trying to even sell. It's just <laughs> random, random, like, scenes and stuff from other, from, you know what I mean, that are all just made up. So if you went yeah. to see that movie... If it actually existed, it would. It wouldn't. It, none of that would be in there anyway. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's, 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 I, I said that they should do. Um, like I, I was up for doing a what's it called Groundhog Day sequel, <laughs> but but what you do is you just release Groundhog Day. You just change the title card. You just say, "Oh, this is Groundhog Day," but you change the title card, and it's you just release Groundhog Day, and people will go. Oh, I get it. That's great. We got to see Groundhog Day in the cinema, and then there'll be other people that go, "God damn it! I hated this. This is terrible." So you know, it's the, the 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 Ryan Johnson approach: <laughs> enrage as much as you endear. <laughs> um, so you know, j- just um, I know we were talking for about an hour. You know, Mark. It, it, just in closing, I wanted to ask about Fistful of Lead. You know, how how, how did you you come across you know that opportunity to make that film? Um, you know, with, with, with you know, because I, I don't know if I'm allowed, how much I'm allowed to say, but you know, how, how did you get the opportunity to to sort of start making this film, and you know, because that'll be that'll be the second film that you're going to have released by the end of this month. Uh, yeah, we'll have it finished the end of the month. I think it's coming out in December. Um, because I guess the difference between Nightshoe is that I'll finish it, and that the thing's going to be released in the UK virtually straight away. Uh, but um, the Sony want to spend more time like building up the marketing and you know, and then looking at what they can they can do to really push it. So uh, even though our release is far away, our deadline is is roughly the same. Um, but what happened there was we were looking for money for night shooters and we were speaking to um, an investor that there's a filmmaker. He's absolutely incredible. He's worth looking at. He's a, he's a Welsh Roger Corman. And uh, I, I met him through an interview, a guy called Andrew Jones. And I met him during this interview. And in this interview, uh, he was talking about how he'd, you know, he took the IP for <laughs> a Night of the Living Dead, made a film called Night of the Living Dead Requiem. And he was the first to admit, he said, look, the film's not that great, but, you know, I, I, I just love making movies. So I made this movie. And he made this film, like The Living Dead, Requiem, because he knew that that would sell. And then he did an Amityville one, and he knew that would sell. And he just started doing all these really smart choices, and he started building up invest, uh, investors. And, and, and the guy makes something like six movies a year. And they all sell. And, uh, and Sony US, I think, have released all of them. And I, I'm, I was just in awe of this guy's ability to – his business model. Um, he's uh, like, like a very low-budget Blumhouse, right? Um, so I sort of said to him, I said, you know, I, I asked him, I said, look, I'm looking for money to do night shooters. And he put me in touch with his investors and his investors, we got along with very well. It's a very generous thing for a filmmaker to do, by the way, to put you in touch with the investors. It, it's not a, it's not a done thing uh, you know, directors don't even ask. It's kind of, it's terrible. It's like asking to sleep with a family member. It's, 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 it's wrong. You, you, you worked to get those investors. You shouldn't. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't really get involved. You shouldn't say, "Oh, can I have some of your pie?" Because that's money off his table. It's money away from his films. Um, but he was very generous. And he sort of uh, so my producer spoke to these guys, and uh, they were trying to get money for night shooters. And it was a bit of a sort of like, "Oh, if it could be this, we could do it. If it could be this, we could do it." Um, but then uh, you know, another company sort of stepped in and said, "Oh, we'd like to make night shooters." And so we thought, oh, there's a dilemma. Do we keep working on it so that these guys can make it? Or do we just say yes to these these other guys who, who are offering a very good deal, make night shows with them, and then just stay in touch with the other investor? The other investor said, if you've got someone willing to put money in, definitely do it. Don't worry about that. However, if you are able to, uh, we'd love you to make this this Western. Um, and, and so I just said, fuck it. Yeah, let's do it. If we can shoot at this date... We'll be able to, we'll be able to do both. Um, and Michelle, Michelle Parkin, my producer, said, Are "You sure that's a lot of work?" And I said, "It's a lot of work for me. I think I can do it. Do you think you could do it?" She went and she said, um, "I don't think this is entirely true." But she said, "Oh, it's less work for me. Uh, it's more work for you because you've got now two feature films to shoot, direct, write, and edit, and uh, not in that order, obviously." And uh, so she, uh, so I thought, "Hey, right, now let's do it." And um, and yeah, so that's how that one sort of fell together. But it's really interesting because we were able to look at what we did in Night Shooters, which was uh, very ambitious. And then we looked at the planning that we sort of put into uh, Fistful of Lead. And comparatively, 
maybe it's because we shot for nights for three weeks when we shot Fistful of Lead in two weeks. That was somehow the goddamn easiest film shoot I've ever done in my entire life. It was a breeze. There were two hard days on it. And that was just because we were dealing with weather a lot because it was a huge snow storm that hit the UK when we shot it. Um, and that just meant that our film looked amazing because it looked very expensive because we had huge expanses of land with snow, which you don't get very often in, in the UK. So when you see it in films like, um, like Django or The Hateful Eight, there's a quality to having it set a Western set in snow. And uh, although I didn't initially want that because I thought that was Tarantino territory, uh, when I saw it, I was like, oh, this is great. We've also got to spray blood in this. This looks, <laughs> this looks amazing. So, um, so yeah, so we just sort of shot that and we did them back to back. And it was, it's really interesting. It's really interesting working with both companies on films that have similar budgets, uh, just because it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how, how the two different investors managed it really. And, um, I, I think for, uh, Michelle, who's, I think these are the first we've produced a lot. She's produced a lot of television before. Uh, so she's very familiar with what I can do and what, what I need and, 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 and <laughs> when to tell me no. Um, I, I think that these, these were like our, our first two feature films together. And uh, yeah, and I think we, I've, I've, the collaboration has been incredible. Um, it's amazing. I think if anything, Michelle is as much a psychologist for me uh, as she is a producer. <laughs> and um, <laughs> she, she keeps me very well protected from things that, that like you're not going to be very good at dealing with this. So you go over there, you leave it to me and I'll, t- I'll deal with this. And I'm like, I'm happy to get involved in the conversation. Don't, don't cut. No, 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 I'll, I'll get involved. She's like, no, no, no. I don't want you there. Fuck off over there. <laughs> Behave yourself. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she keeps me in check. She's excellent. Um, she's, she's, I, I, she, she's the only person I think who, uh, can say, don't do that. And I'll be like, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, she's, <laughs> And it's not from it's not from any uh, any any sort of a it doesn't come from any a position of authority or anything. It's all to do with just like absolute respect. Like I've got I've got so much respect for her and, and how we work together, and uh, that it is and, and it's so rare to find a producer you can have this sort of uh, relationship with. That like we, when she asks for something, I'm like okay, fine. Like she can give me notes, and <laughs> is one of four people on the planet who can give me notes and I don't go what <laughs> you know because you know this is this is this is the the, the horrendous ego of uh of a, of a writer director <laughs> it's that, getting, getting notes but that's when you be, that's when you become Mr. Bastard like we were talking about earlier that's when you, <laughs> and you're like god damn that Mark he Mr. is bastard. such a bastard <laughs> but yep but with, with Michelle she's like this doesn't make any sense can you you should fix that I'm like oh, all right <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a little child just like you're rubbing his heels on the floor and kicking the dirt and go fine I'll do it now then you know it's great it's it's I, I, I it's um like I'm really excited and of course we're, we're we're about to produce another film for someone we're just waiting for all the um for everything to fall into line and when it all falls into line then we have ourselves uh, a budget and we can do the Roger Coleman thing of of getting uh, a filmmaker their first feature which uh, I'm really excited about um because as a producer, I, I, I'm hands off. I'm, I'm there if they want me. If you get stuck, I've got a camera. I'll go shoot a scene. I can shoot a second unit and do whatever you want. Or I'll stay here and just eat the catering and <laughs> and, and, and write the next one that I want to make. You know, I'm, 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 uh, like, I'm not really interested in telling people how to make films. Like uh, the, the idea is we go to filmmakers who make films themselves. And, and it's like, right, you use your team. You make your film your way. And, uh, you know, if this one all comes together, I I'm not allowed to talk about it yet, which is really rubbish. Um, I'll tell you on Facebook. I'll, t- I'll message yeah, you later. Tell you about it. Um, but like, it's it's one of those things where it's uh, we we just you know it. Uh, I, I'm really excited at what this director's pulled together with his resources. He's an infinitely better director than I am. You know, uh, if he wasn't my friend, I'd be a really <laughs> bitter, jealous person. But um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's I, I'm really quite excited about what we're doing with our next. So that would be if that all works out. That's three films in a year. So I've, di- I've written and directed two of them. Although I did co-write Fistful of Lead. Phil Dias really uh, is a writer friend. He stood up and really helped us out there. Um, and then this third film will be one I'm just producing. And if all goes well, we might have another action film in November, which I'm really hoping we do because uh, I was meant to be doing something else. But I think that's going to be pushed back 
So I'm going to try. So it'd be kind of in my head. I'd be like, ooh, three films in a year. That'd be nice. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this for the rest of my life. So I may as well do it whilst I have the youthful exuberance. Yeah, you, you got you to gotta hit. We got to get the momentum going. That's what I found. Um, when I stopped for a while, honestly, Mark, it's so hard to get back. And actually, that's why I'm starting. I'm going to get back on the horse next month. Uh, and I'm going to shoot the first thing I've shot in probably five years, four wow. years. Yeah, Jason, amazing. You, 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 you said this last time we spoke. Um, what, what happened there? What happened there? You said you were going to do that. We spoke about a year and a half ago, maybe. Uh, um, I think. No idea. I have. Uh, I, I don't even know what we were talking about at that point. Um, you said you were going to start making films again. I'm guessing. I'm guessing you didn't. Um, my, my, my Facebook stalking didn't reveal anything. So like, you know, I don't want to, you know, you, you should totally do it, dude. It's, it, I, I know it's, I know it's tough, but like, I'd always recommend making a film. Cause even if you made a bad one, you're a better filmmaker having made that bad one. So, and you know, so if you keep making bad ones, three bad films later, you're three times a better filmmaker. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's worth doing. Even if you're just making a, a short with two people sat around the table, talking about a goldfish you know it's it's something um so i'd recommend it but you know it's you know if you if you, if you need any moral support dude i'm here i'm always here just come and i'll happily <laughs> i'll happily talk you into it that's what well, i love doing I, well uh, well i i don't know what i was planning on doing at that point um it could have been one of two things but what, what i'm doing with this one is um i'm sort of taking the reins of more things myself like i like i, I used to do where it was uh basically you know, I, I was wearing many hats, but the, the the upside to it was I knew what was getting done and what wasn't truthfully. Um, right. You know, and, and I've gotten, you know, since I, I don't want to, maybe a couple years ago, before I even started doing this podcast, I would get offers all the time. And it would be like these ridiculous offers. Um, like, for instance, I got offered to be a part of this website, uh, which was pretty big at the time. And at, at the time, they were actually ready to partner with the Nerdist. And then all of a yeah. sudden they were like, oh, but you have to pay for everything and we're not going to pay you for this. You're just right, going to get exposure. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, I can maybe make something out of this. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, is it worth it? And then I'm like, you know what? So I, I emailed the guy back and I just told him my concerns. Um, never got back to me whatsoever. And I'm like, you know right, what? Right. What, what, what? What if I had actually done this? What if I actually, actually went through, spent thousands or hundreds of dollars or whatever yeah. making something and then he just never got back to me anyway? And I'd ha- I'm, and what, what then? I mean – so with this, what I'm going to do is next month, I've already started to sit down. I storyboarded the whole thing out. I have somebody building an animatic cool. right now. I've been actually telling people in the podcast, I've been saying, if you want to help me, shoot me a freaking email. Um, but um, Yeah, how's it going? Is it going good? Which the part? feedback good? The feedback part? Is well, that people willing to throw their hat in the ring and, and, and join in? Yeah, I, I actually have had a few people who, who, have emailed, who have emailed me. And you know, we, I've been talking with them. I've had a few people email me. And basically, they're trying to see what they what I can do for them, uh, which is kind of meaning that they're like, "Hey, what's going on with this? Well, hey, can you help me with my project? No, <laughs> it's not. I, I, I'm clearly <laughs> not in a position right now to for you for for me to do that. So, um, you know, it, it's it's you know a lot of I, I think I know what I was I, I was going to do. I think I was going to do something similar to what I'm going to do now. When I mentioned it to you about a year and a half yeah. ago, I, I, I think I was going to do a trailer. Um, yeah. Just to get some eyeballs on some stuff, and then I remember. Then then things kind of went south for a number of different reasons. But I'm making a fake trailer, so it, it, it's, it's yeah. It, it, and so that this is going to be fun. In fact, you know, let me let me send you the stuff when I'm done off of here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Do it, do it, do it. Because I mean, I, I I I think that there's a lot of people who who adopt the attitude of oh, you shouldn't do it. The time's not right. And I'm just like, look, the time never feels right. You know, whenever someone says, here's, here's the money you asked for to make a film of this budget that you wrote specifically for this budget, uh, we're shooting in a month. When that day shows up, I'm still like, shit, was the script good enough to do? Like, you constantly feel unprepared, no matter how prepared you are. So just embrace it and, and, and roll with it and make, make a shitty movie or make a great movie. Just make a movie. Just like, you know, you, you, all you can do is do the best you can do at that particular moment in time. And, and, and sometimes we screw it up and we have to get a pickup of a hand picking things up or sometimes we get it right. And we got the whole thing in a single shot. You know, it, it, it's, it's, I, I'm, I would encourage constantly to make, um, just make movies. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that is the, uh, you know, I, I 
when, when people say, you know, it's got to be the right time, and I'm guilty of that too, you're right. It's never going to be the right time. Um, it, it, and you know what I found that particularly true, by the way, is when writing a screenplay. Uh, I think sometimes people think that you know, they have to have everything known before they start writing. And I'm like, you know what? I, I, the people that I all know who are the most successful screenwriters have all said, you know, that we, we don't really know everything before we start because, you know, there's a lot of co- downside to that. And not only that, but it really it's kind of hard to actually grasp a screenplay because usually you get an idea and then you go, okay, well, now I know the whole story about what this is. And then you start writing it. And then you hit a bunch of dead ends or brick walls or obstacles, yeah. or whatever, and you're like, "Oh shit! Now what do you? Now, now what do I do? Well, I'm going to start over again." And then you perpetually never ever finish anything. Um, so I, 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 that's another thing to watch out for is is, is those mm. kind of obstacles. And see, that's why this podcast exists, Mark. So we get guys who are actually out there doing it, like yourself, and coming back here, and you know, it's like you know, the, it's just a, a chat and a laugh. Remember, you ever see the TV show Extras? Yeah, I love Xmas. So, so remember the second season um, when uh, – maybe it's the first season. But anyways, remember when Ricky befriends that guy on that Samuel L. Jackson yeah. uh, set? And he's a big guy, and he's like, oh, I found the Joker of the pack. He's like, it's just a chat yeah. and a laugh. That's what this is. It's a chat and a laugh. I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's bring it all the way back to Star Wars, to the Phantom Menace. <laughs> that guy plays um, – he's a Welsh actor, a few of my mates know him. That guy plays uh, the general uh, of Jar Jar Binks' army. <laughs> Use the boom boom jar jar. That's that guy. Um, there you go. <laughs> we brought it full circle, dude. Well, there you go. I, I don't think there's anything left to talk about. <laughs> I, I think we have we have officially just just you know solved all the problems in the universe, and we've exposed the crack in the matrix. And also, we had a very mature conversation about the Last Jedi. Considering you hated it, and I absolutely loved it, we had a very mature conversation about it. There was no name calling, or you know, you, you didn't call me like a cuck, and I didn't call you a sexist. It was a great. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> although, love- although, although in the UK, a good insult is a cock. You cock, as you know. So uh, I would have assumed you meant that if you would have gone down that road, which of course you wouldn't. You're a decent human being. Yeah, yeah, I- I'm gonna I'm gonna talk shit on you later on though. I'm gonna say, oh, I have this friend of mine. He's a bastard. In fact, his name is Mister Bastard. And he actually he actually liked the Last Jedi. What a freaking cuck! What a cuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that'll learn me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll be like, I think someone in America is talking about me right now, and they'll be like, Oh come on, Mark, who's talking about you in America right now? Oh god, the the stems of my snowflake are melting. I can tell. <laughs> Um, yeah, but no, it's, it's a very mature conversation. Like we we did we did good, sir. Um, <laughs> before, before we go, Mark, uh, where can people find you at online? I am uh, on Twitter. I'm at at Mark underscore V underscore Price. I'm sorry, I was early to Twitter and I didn't really do anything with it, so I have one of those annoying underscore names. Um, I'm also the same handle on uh, Instagram as well, where I'm posting a lot of pictures about the films that we're doing as well. So there's a lot. There's a lot on there. Uh, Instagram, I'm very active on Instagram, but I think uh, Twitter, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, I'm working on not leaving Twitter out. My Twitter is I, all I do is retweet shit that makes me laugh. So my Twitter feed is just Star Wars and, you know, shit like that. <laughs> well, I'm gonna link to the, all that in the show notes, everybody, and you can see all the things that make Mark laugh uh, on his <laughs> feeds, uh, and you can see me tweet about God knows what. I'm gonna start using my my uh, other personal Twitter more. Because uh, I kind of abandoned it, Mark, to just do the podcast Twitter because it was getting a lot more feedback, you know. And oh. I was kind of like, well, what the hell's the point of you know using this one? So, and I have one of those. And I was an early adopter of Twitter, and I late, and I was very late, and I still. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was late in changing my name though, and I I had to get Dave underscore Bullis, and I'm like, mother, god damn it! <laughs> and because a guy who has Dave Bullis, yeah, uh, actually blocked me. Because uh, so many people were tweeting at him, and I said, "Listen, let's just switch usernames." And I said, "I'll make it worth your while too. I'll slip you like 20, 20, 20 bucks, whatever." And he and he blocked me. He actually blocked me, and I was like, "Well, there you go." So, because um, people were tweeting at him, and he's like, "I'm not that Dave Bullis. It's this guy here." And I'm like, "Dude, just switch with me, for God's sakes." <laughs> there's a there's a politician, uh, John Favreau, spelt the same. The first thing he, he's got under it is not that one. <laughs> I immediately know, right? That's not. Uh, that's not. I, he's like, I did not direct Iron Man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, t- yeah, Twitter's yes, yeah. It's, um, t- Twitter stuffs. Uh, I, I love a bit of Twitter. 
It's great. It's how I get my news. But that's how I get the gossip on my news. I'll see it on Twitter, then I'll try verifying it by going to an actual news source and go, ooh. <laughs> it's all the fake all the fake news and stuff. You kinda like go, all right, yeah. <laughs> it's like great white shark spotted off Cordwell. Holy shit, that's cool. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I have friends who post stuff on Facebook and Twitter and this, this and that. And some of the stuff that I, I see them post, I go, guys, that there's no way that could be true on any <laughs> which way you slice them. I don't care. I don't care if you're if whatever political party or whatever you're you're from. There's no way this could be true. There there, there would literally be a, a mass uproar, or there would literally be uh, some kind of like government investigation, one way or the other. There's just no way. <laughs> Or, or maybe I'm maybe I'm the idiot and they're actually they have all the truth. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm I'm such a sucker. Like I, I'll I'll watch anything. I go, whoa, wow, that's cool. And I, you know, I'll check it out before just blindly believing it because I've learned from my mistakes. But I was like, oh, oh wow, and I believe things for a brief moment before I find out they're not true. I'm like, ah, shit. Uh, but there was that one. Remember that um, meteor over Russia a few years back? It might have been about five years ago. And all those dash cams caught it. And yeah. I just went. That's the fakest thing I've ever seen. That's bullshit. There's no way that's real. Yeah, that one was. So the one time I called out thinking, learn from your mistakes, Mark. Don't trust anything. That's bullshit. Yeah, it was real. And I was like, why the fuck are there so many dash cams in Russia? And then I found out, which I went on a wormhole of YouTube that day, man. It was <laughs> those are Russians throwing themselves in front of cars for fake insurance scams. It was, uh, yeah, it was a day. It. It, was a, it, was, it was a great day. It was, uh, I was, I think I was working on Magpie at the time. I remember just sitting there going, I'm having a day off today. I'm watching Russians try to run themselves over and meteors, and uh, that's that, that was my day. That was a great day. That was a life of a freelancer, man. It's, uh, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> It's yeah, ridiculous. It's, I should be ashamed of myself. No, hey, it's all good, man. It's uh, it's all good. It's uh, because I, I actually always wondered that too, and then I found out that there was so much insurance fraud over there that that's why everyone drives now with a dashboard camera. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and to clarify, incidentally, this might seem like you know, like him lording it up, taking a day off because he just decided to. I was broke as fuck as well at that point, so it was really, really stupid. I was living with my parents, <laughs> so I was like, "Mom, I gotta stay here for a couple of months to get the to, to just to try and save some money." So it was a pretty. That was a that was one of the dark times before the freelancing really picked up. But my God, yes, uh, it was still, it was still a day off. Uh, I remember it fondly. Back in the past, I'd love another one. <laughs> Well, it'll be funny. What if you got an idea watching all these scam artists? You're like, oh, I could fake a scam. Or I could fake a good <laughs> scam. I could do that for money. And, and your I, parents are like, no, Mark, you're not doing that. I did think about getting the dog to do something really cute so I could film it and send it into a TV show and get 200 quid. Uh, but I was, you know, the, their FTP upload site was so frustrating. I was like, ah, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even film anything with the dog. I was just exploring the options. Like, this is too time consuming. I, I can't do this. I'll, 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 I'll carry on making the film I'm making. I hope that makes me money. <laughs> 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 Which uh, it didn't. Uh, that's filmmaking for you. <laughs> so, but but now you are, are you? Do you I mean, just out of curiosity, you, like, do you live in like a flat with a bunch of other people now, or? Yeah, I'm living in London now, so I've, uh, I'm living oh, with... Oh, Jesus, you're broke. I know you're broke now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working with a friend of mine. Actually, they're, they're very creative guys. So uh, one of my flatmates works on uh, a Game of Thrones uh, show, uh, Thronecast, which is, um, which is like a British equivalent of, hey, we just watched an episode of Game of Thrones, so let's, uh, let's talk about it uh, for an hour. So it's one of those shows. Well, um, make, sure, but... make sure you tell them about this show. Oh, yeah, hell yeah. I mean, do you know what's really cool, actually, about his little Game of Thrones thing? Is I was on a film shoot once, and there was a guy uh, on the camera department. One of those guys, is, you just get the impression this guy is just a bit of a just a bit of a tool. And he was he was bragging about fucking, oh, I saw Battle of the Bastards last night. And he wanted to just ruin the episode for people who hadn't seen it. And I just went, mate, my flatmate works on Thronecast. He's already seen the final episode next week. If you fuck this episode up for me, I'm going to tell you what happens in the very last episode and fuck your episode up. I could do that because if you do that, you would have equivalent the equivalent of ruined the whole damn series for me. So I'll just blow the last episode for you. So don't don't test me, pal. Um, and then of course the last episode came on. I had to work with him for another five days. That was ten. <laughs> 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 but to give him credit, he was all talk. He didn't actually blow it, and he didn't blow it for anyone. He was just teasing everyone very convincingly, which is a confusing way to joke. But hey, you know whatever works. <laughs> <laughs> whatever works for you um but uh yeah it's uh but no it's it's a uh, it's a cool uh it's it, it's really great um because like the, the, the game of thrones obsession in the in the flat is pretty intense and uh you know i think a lot of the guys are in it somewhere 
like I'm behind Jamie Lannister there. If you would have just moved to the left, you'd see me as an extra and shit like that. <laughs> so it's, it's quite funny. Uh, it's, um, you know, and one of my camera assistants is like, I'm one of those guys in the background. I'm like, which one, the bald one? I'm like, there's fucking nine bald people back there, dude. It's like, how the fuck am I supposed to know? And they're all out of focus around fire. Like, I can't tell which one's you. And he said, I think I'm that one. <laughs> like, it's funny. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, we're in great times, aren't we? Where television is so rich and exciting. Um, it's, uh, yeah, in many ways, I'm glad I don't have a career because I'd probably love to direct the Game of Thrones episode and it would just ruin the whole series for me. <laughs> You're like, it was great until I got to direct it. It was all going great. And then, uh, you know, that, that one by uh, Mark V. Price just kind of... Yeah. <laughs> it, the camera was just pointing around in places because he wouldn't look. He just was like, I'm pointing over there and, and have them do the lines over there. I'm not looking. Just tell me if it's in focus. Cool, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, that'd be me directing Game of Thrones, Boardwalk Empire, Better Call Saul, any show that I like. It's just going to be, that is all it would be, would be me just going like, ah, don't tell me, just tell me if it was in focus. It is. <laughs> Did they sound like they meant it when they said the lines? Then great, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> that's generally how I direct it anyway. I mean, I don't know if I'm very good. <laughs> that, 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 that's your secret right there. We've just had it revealed. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that is just kind of like, all right, was it, was it in focus? All right, moving on. <laughs> Did they sound like they meant it? Great. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> oh. Okay, buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were trying to wrap this up half hour ago. I'm so sorry. I'm just waffling like crazy. Do you edit these? Do you uh, edit Actually, stuff? I try not to. I, I, I actually find that unless – um, something was said that was that somebody was retracted. I, I don't really edit too much of the audio out. Obviously, I improve the audio, um, right. but, but not really editing. Um, I, I think it's more it works even better just that way. Um, oh, just having it yeah, go yeah. up, yeah. Yeah, I hope this has been entertaining. It's, it's, it's terrifying. We're just talking. I forget that we're doing this for your podcast. It's just a conversation. That, that, that's 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 a good sign, though. I I, I, that, I think that's so. A, yeah. So. Um, cool. I, so Mark, I appreciate you coming on, man. And every, and this, by the way, you're next on the, you're next up. Uh, and I want to say thank you so much for coming on and uh, I'm going to link to everything we talked about in the show notes, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you very much, man. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.